Welcome to Policy Chats, the official podcast of the School of Public Policy at the University of California, Riverside. I'm your host, Rachel Strassman. Join me and my classmates as we learn about potential policy solutions for today's biggest societal challenges. Thank you so much for joining us today, Director Mays. We are truly excited. Call me Candace. Oh, Candace probably, yeah. No, okay, yes. no one says that ever anywhere. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll call you Candace. Yes, please call <laughs> me Candace. <laughs> You're all good. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Candace. Thank you for having me. Of course, we're truly excited to have you here on Policy Chats as the Project Director of Mapping Black California, your expertise leveraging GIS and data reporting to highlight the voices of marginalized black communities across California is incredibly important. And today we're eager to dive into your expertise on the availability of comprehensive data, how gaps in population data impact policy, and the critical role data plays in shaping informed equitable policies. So with that, let's get right into our first question. Okay. The journey of policy is intricate and it extends far beyond the publicized moments of voting on policies or initial implementation. Can you explain the role that data plays in shaping policy throughout its life cycle? I'm honestly still learning a lot about that myself from being in this industry. Um, One of the things I think is that data is foundational to understanding the context of, of any community whether you're looking at that community from like a spatial lens or a demographic lens, or you're looking at economics, you need to understand the the numbers in a nuanced way um, in order to really know what a community needs. And I think part of the data, we were talking about on the way here that data is not just numbers. Um, you know, there's qualitative data and there's quantitative, quantitative data. And people's stories are just as important as the numbers. So it's important to not only ask the community or ask the, the region or what, like whatever population you're looking at what they need, what their experiences are, but, and also then compare and contrast with the data. Because a lot of times there will be overlap. And if there are gaps, if, if a lot of community members are asking for one thing and then the data is not reflecting that need, then there's a strong chance that the issue is with the gaps in the data, not in what the community members are saying their experience is. So I think that's first and foremost of like, to pass a policy, do research. Um, I think about during, you know, the height of the Black Lives Matter protesting, and they made Juneteenth a national holiday, and no one was asking for that. We did not need, Juneteenth was our holiday, we didn't need it to be all of America's holiday. No one asked for that. No one asked for elected officials to kneel in the rotunda of the Capitol wearing kente stoles. Like, no one asked for that. Like, who passed that policy? But that wasn't what we were asking for. We were asking for something about police brutality and violence. Um, And so I think, you know, first and foremost, you have to listen. Whenever we're doing research projects or we're developing a big initiative, we want to make sure we're not building something that is not useful to the audience that we're building it for, that we're actually trying to support. And so we have to go out and listen to what their needs are. We build a prototype, we get feedback, we say, is this actually useful? What else would you need for this to be or not be in order for it to help you with what your needs are? And I think a lot of times, you know, elected officials, and legislative members and even policymakers aren't paying attention to that because there's other factors at play in deciding what gets brought to the floor and what doesn't. Um, in my experience, you know, I have one experience with where we had success with policy, and I know we're going to talk more about it later. But it was really as simple as just stating a need to the person who had the power to like change the need. And I didn't realize what I was asking for was a policy change. I was just like, hey, we had access to this thing, now we don't, and we need it. You know, that was it was really as simple as that. Um, And so I think in gathering the data, you're really just doing your due diligence about what does the community need and then using that to inform policy versus vice versa. Uh, I want to pass this policy, now let me go back and see if the community actually needs it. Or I pass this policy and come to find out that wasn't what would have really helped them. That's very interesting that you mentioned like being intentional with um, the data you're collecting and earlier in your response. about how you can be collecting data, but it's not all relevant to the public need or the problem in play. Do you see that more often there's an issue with getting the data in the first place or that there is data being collected, it's just not really relevant to the public problem? Well, data being collected, not being relevant to the public problem speaks to the foundation of the first part um, 
of your question, which I think was access and data, because then you, if it's not being collected relevant to the public problem, you can't access the data you're actually looking for to inform you on what the public problem is. Um, and we encounter that at, on a daily basis in Mapping Black California. And I think any data analyst who works with a marginalized community, not just a black community, but if you're working with LGBTQ groups, if you're working with disabled communities, whatever the case may be, you on a regular basis are encountering, encountering barriers where you're not able to find the data you need access to. Because part of data collection, um, data is collected by humans. We have meetings of clients that are like, how can we automate this and automatically have it be gathered? And we're like, a person still has to either upload the spreadsheet directly into the system or enter in all of the, you know, the numbers in the cells, like you still need a human. And so what that creates is the, the opening for there then to be human-based bias and errors, right? Like, so as a person, if I'm gathering the data, I'm gonna be thinking about unconsciously, sometimes consciously, but also unconsciously, what's important to me. And that's gonna be prioritized in whatever that data, that data collection looks like. Um, and, I, or, and, and that could be because of my identity, it could be because of my experience, it could just be because of my lack of knowledge of, oh, I didn't realize X, Y, and Z is different in this group than in this group, mm -hmm. um, for whatever reasons. So we, we encounter that all the time. We recently had, over the summer, a meeting with the ACLU where they were asking for access to some policing information. And I was like, kind of like amazed sitting in this, we were on Zoom and I was like, you're the ACLU, if you don't have it, like nobody has it, we definitely don't have it. And we encounter those barriers all the time where we know there's a problem happening because we're listening to the community and we're hearing about it. Some of us are experiencing it in our own lives on a daily basis, but then there's no numbers to support it. And that also becomes an issue of bias and like um, the cultural framing of what's important because to mainstream westernized societies, data is important, numbers are important. Where is your proof that this is really happening against someone's word? And in communities of color, we are a community of oral historians. So if I hear this, then that, that, that to us is verifiable. Um, and especially if I hear it from multiple people, then that is showing me a pattern. And so you could come and say, I've heard 10 people say X, Y, and Z is happening in the community, and the person in authority is saying, well, we don't have any record of that. So then in their opinion, it's not happening. Um, so, you know, we, we always believe the community stories, and our role in finding the data is to remove that possibility of someone saying, that's not happening, that's not true because here are the numbers that are supporting that it's true. But if you can't find those numbers, because either they're not being gathered or they're intentionally being being omitted, because that, ha that happens as well, um, then you can't, you, you can't support the veracity of those stories. And then it always continues to be hearsay. And then that's how you get decades and centuries of hearsay, of, you know, things that, you know, that, um, where people have oral histories and, 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 and historical memories of events happening continuously, but there's no record of it. So then did it happen? Yeah, I think um, you bring up very interesting points and kind of going into that more, talking about the consequences of not having data to highlight the lived experiences of the community members. What are the consequences that you have seen of designing these policies without taking that into consideration? And do you have any specific examples that you could share with uh, that shed light on some negative outcomes? Um, I mean, they negatively impact people's daily lives and not just in small ways of like, oh, like there's extra traffic on the freeway, like people die because of these things, people are homeless, people get incarcerated unjustly because of a lack of access to data or understanding of, of the bias in these policies or the bias in these laws and in the, these sentencing practices. Um, or in, in housing practices, and then how that translates generationally. Um, and so I think about, for example, we talk a lot in map making about redlining and Sanborn maps. And these Sanborn maps are basically for insurance adjusters to like assess the values of homes based upon where people live. And so the colors are red, yellow, green, and blue. And you can imagine which ones are bad colors, which ones are mediocre, and which ones are great. And when you look at these communities, the black people lived in the red places. And so their houses, because they, they mapped out where black people live, that's red. That's, that's arbitrarily how they decided that. 
And so those houses were undervalued. That's where they decided to run freeways through. And so there was continued disinvestment in the community and disruption of the economic lifelines of these communities with these practices, which then translates to a lack of generational wealth, right? It translates to a lack of educational attainment, job, job attainment and career growth, and it, and it continues. And then people can shrug and say, oh, that's just how it is. Some people are poor. No, some people are not poor. There's policies and practices in place that disrupt your ability to strive for more. Um, and so a specific example that I think of, I used to be a public school teacher. Um, I taught with, for the New York City Department of Education. And when I was entering my master's program, it was right around the time that um, test taking was viewed as the answer to assessing educational like attainment and learning among students. And everyone knew that test taking does not actually accurately reflect what a, what a child has learned during the school year, what they're retaining, you know, and how they apply that to their next grade level or life or whatever else. Everyone knew this, this was common knowledge, but it was the most affordable way to assess millions of people. Um, and so that's a prime example. And so in my training from that, right, then, then test became this like, this high pressure situation. When I was a kid and you took a test, you went to you woke up, ate a breakfast, went to school, got a juice box and some graham crackers, and then you took your test and you went to lunch and you had a day and it wasn't this big deal and you knew it wasn't a big deal. Um, versus when I was entering teaching at schools, because there was a way for you to have there were schools that did project based learning and so testing wasn't as big a deal. And there were schools that were testing based and then you know your test scores aren't just assigned to the students; it's assigned to the teachers. And those tests aren't taking into consideration the socioeconomic conditions of, of the children in that school and how that impacts learning, how that impacts outcomes. Um, and then it also, those, those little test scores that reflect on teachers who are allegedly not teaching. Wow, but they're also making sure children are hungry in the classroom. They're also, they're also social workers. They're, you know, they're, they're nurses sometimes. They're, all the, they're mental health professionals, even though they're not, um, just to get the child to learn. And so I think that was really detrimental to our educational system. I think it was de detrimental to the profession of teaching. Um, and I, I, I taught in both environments. I taught in an environment where the test really determined how well the school was viewed at, as doing. And I taught in an environment where testing wasn't a big deal. And I remember, and I tried very hard not to stress the test to my students. Um, but it was still a school culture of like the principal brought it up on a regular basis and like during the year like when kids would get in trouble she would call them out for their test scores um and so at the end of the year you know we take the test and there's still a month six weeks left in school because you know tests don't happen last day and i i had students ask me why are we still learning where the test is over wow. you know like that's an example of policies being passed in, in opposition to what the data is saying, which is that's not how children learn, and that doesn't reflect what learning looks like. And now we're, we're in this current situation of um, you know, public school systems deteriorating, people removing their children from public school systems and privatizing their education. Even on like a collegiate level then, when you're looking at like the, like, the shrinking and the disbandment of, of liberal arts departments, mm -hmm. you know, in favor of, of majors that are more streamlined to specific occupations, because that's where students who go to college are now majoring in because now college is viewed as, you know, you're going to college to get a job versus it used to be you go to college to learn, you know, and, and to like explore. Um, and so I think that's an example of something that was really detrimental and that continues to have long-term effects. Because then it wasn't about schooling and learning, it was about getting a result. And with any, there's ways to, to teach kids test taking skills to get them the result, whether or not they know what they're doing or not. Circle C topic sentence, you know, there's all these tricks and then throughout the school year, you're teaching them tricks instead of thinking skills, which are more complicated and take longer, you know? Yeah, and I, I think that's a testament to the fact that one metric isn't the end-all be-all. And like with your earlier example, you know, even if you solve the issue that policies for generations have been inhibiting communities of color's ability to build generational wealth, then you have to consider the fact that they have, um, they like significantly have less opportunities for economic mobility. So, you know, comparing to a non-student or a student not of color versus a student of color, even if they might start off a little bit worse off, they have higher chances of then um, continuing to rise up economically while the communities of color don't. And there's so many like intricacies to those policies. So same with test taking, that just 
one test doesn't show you the whole picture, even if it is a metric. Yeah, and honestly, I can't fully speak to whether or not like a person who's not of color that's poor and poor has more of a chance of rising up economically versus a person of color, because we also know that the like the economic divide in this country is the greatest it's ever been, and and part of the racialization of people is to separate what what people hold more in common. So like a you know a, a low in, an impoverished per, per, non person of color has more in common with a low income person of color than with another non person of color, but they don't realize these commonalities. And so um, I think while and this is now this is not anything scientific, but I think while they may have somewhat of a better chance, being that they're not going to encounter like racialized discrimination. You know, they're, they're going to encounter economic and classist discrimination about where they come from. Um, I watch Housewives, and they do it all the time. And all of those people technically have some sort of money. Um, so, so yeah, so I can't speak to that. But I do think there's, when, when you're talking about, like, oh, like with, even with housing, like, the housing issue still hasn't been solved. You know, they pass a law saying you can't discriminate, but then they figure out other ways to do it. And I think what happens that... Um, then it goes into like reparations and things like that is there's sub which is what you're, I think you're touching on there's subsequent issues that you then have to address and put policies and practices and programs and initiatives and whatever else in place to amend and I and those aren't one thing's going to fix everything or even one thing's going to fix the one thing it's going to be multiple things and I think the messiness of when you mess up people's lives it's gonna. It took generations to get them there. It's gonna take generations to get them out. Is is where um, is where there's there's like there there's failure. Truth, accuracy, fairness, curiosity. These are the pillars of journalism and of higher education. At the Wall Street Journal. We pride ourselves on being a trusted and essential resource. The Wall Street Journal is partnered with the University of California, Riverside to provide your campus an unparalleled access to essentials to be prepared academically, professionally, and personally. Students get full access to WSJ News, curated newsletters, challenges, podcasts, and documentary series to help stay up to date. Activate your school-sponsored subscription today at wsj.com slash UC Riverside. Yeah, I think um, you bring up a lot of great examples and kind of switching it around to hopefully a little bit more of a positive <laughs> uh, Aside from the fact that, you know, a lot of things are broken, um, can you share an ex example of a successful policy um, intervention that was driven by comprehensive data um, and how that was able to be achieved? Um, yes, but it still comes from a bad thing. Um, and I'll try it. Something else might pop up in my brain while I'm talking. Um, we, during, at the beginning of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, there were a lot of, you know, there was a lot of like, misinformation, disinformation. I feel like that's when these two words really like became super popular. And there's a lot of confusion around what it was, how did you get it, who gets it, where it come from, all of those things. And as a result, there were also a lot of myths swirling around COVID-19 as it pertained to black people. Um, and that was because the data was showing our infection rates were a lot lower. And so there was this belief that like COVID-19, like black people couldn't get COVID-19 or they were immune to it and all these things. And come to find out it was because data was not being collected on black people as it pertains to COVID-19. Um, and we were hearing, back to qualitative versus quantitative data, we were hearing and experiencing situations where black people were getting infected at extremely high rates and were also dying at extremely high rates from COVID-19. And so, um, we began having conversations, you know, we're, we're a sister organization, we were founded by Black Voice News, so a lot of the research we do gets reported out by the newspaper or reported in tandem with the newspaper. And so um, we were having conversations with Black Voice News about like, well, how is COVID-19 impacting black workers? Because there's a shutdown, people can't go to work. You know, I was fortunate enough to have a job where I could work from home, but like, what if you don't have that? What if you're a frontline worker or a work in a service industry? Um, and there was no reporting on this. And even when we were looking at like New York Times had a dashboard or like the major newspapers had dashboards, but they weren't just aggregating the data by race. 
So it's not telling you what is happening in different communities, which is part of that accessing data and when you can't find things. Because it's often, it's as simple as people don't disaggregate data by race. It's really that simple. Um, and so, and there's more, there's more things, but that's like our main baseline issue that I'm always talking about. And so because the data wasn't disaggregated by race, we couldn't look at quantifiably like what are the issues and impacting our communities because of the COVID-19 pandemic and because of like, you know, the shelter in and all of those things. And so we made our own dashboard looking at like, how does COVID-19, how is COVID-19 impacting black workers? And black workers were more likely to be frontline workers. We were more likely to work in service industries that were then, you know, out of commission because no one's going, to, few people are going to restaurants or wherever else. Um, and because they're, they're more likely to be frontline workers, they're also more likely to contract COVID-19. Um, we know from our other research around like, like public health in the black community, we have terrible public health outcomes. So if you're more likely to contract COVID-19 and there's you have terrible public health outcomes or there's a high probability that you have hypertension or you have diabetes, like that's going to then correlate to the death rates of people dying from COVID-19. And black people died at an extremely high rate from COVID-19. Um, and then you take that and you compound it with other research that we did when we were working on the 2020 census, where we also know black people are more likely to live in multi-generational housing. So not only are you a frontline worker who may have health issues that would make you a high risk person to be infected by COVID-19, you're then contracting it and bringing it home and then spreading it to your multi-generational home, whether it's a grandparent, there's you, there's you know your spouse, there's your children, whoever else may be living there. Um, and so that dashboard, we were the first people, long story short, in the nation to, dis, to report on COVID-19 disaggregated by race um, and specifically looking at black workers. But I think in, I think in general, but I want to just I want to specify that just in case. Um, and so that was like, you know, we got a lot of attention for that work. It, it's been taught in classrooms. That dashboard's been shown around. Um, and eventually we had to depreciate the dashboard and redesign it to a second or phase or iteration of it because once the, once the fear on COVID-19 started to die down, the state stopped reporting worker data disaggregated by race. So we could, never, we could no longer keep the dashboard up to date. Um, and so we had, I'd say, I think that was like 20, that was 2020 going into 2021. And then the end of 2021, we had a private audience with Attorney General Rob Bonta. Now I'm like mixing dates up, 2021, 2022. Where are we now? We're in 20, I think 2022. We're in, it was in 2022. Um, we had a private audience with Attorney General Rob Bonta at the Inland Park Community Foundation. And so we presented on the newspaper, we presented on Mapping Black California, I was walking him through some of our work, and so one of those was the COVID-19 dashboard. And I said, by the way, we had to depreciate this because the state stopped publishing this aggregated worker data by race. And then I kept talking. Um, and I did notice the eyebrows go, but you know, I kept talking. Um, and so two years later, I, I see in the news that, um, a bill was passed, I'm going to look up the numbers because I do see that. Assembly Bill number 1604, Chapter 313, which legally mandates that the state has to report worker data by race. And we are the only state in the nation now to do that. Um, and that's why when you, with your first question of like navigating policy in the long road, I was still learning about that. I didn't realize that me saying, hey, we don't have access to the stat anymore. Can you get it? what it would be me making a policy request. You know, I was just talking to a person who had access to information. Um, and even when the bill passed, I was like, oh, that's amazing, like we needed that. But I was, and I knew like, okay, maybe saying something put a bug in someone's ear, but I wasn't, like I was reluctant to say like, oh, we like passed, because we did it, you know what I mean? But I was like, I, I didn't want to overemphasize our influence on getting it passed. And so, you know, we still report, we still publicized it and said, hey, like we talked to Attorney General about this and we're so happy to see this happen. Um, and then over the summer at um, the Inland Empire Community Foundation Policy Summit, I bumped into one of his people in the, in the lobby and they said, hey, like, like once you said that to us, we ran it up the flagpole. Like that's how that started. Um, and so it was, it was very, you know, you have moments where you're like, is this work working? And so it was exciting to see that happen. Um, we after before that bill was passed, but after we had that meeting, um, we had done reporting and the LA Times launched a huge report on um, discrimination in the warehouse industry between black and Latino workers. 
um, and how black workers were, were be, being treated terribly. Um, and that's one of those examples of how can you fully as assess the extent of this discrimination and the impacts of it if you don't know the numbers by race of who's working in these industries, right? And so that's a prime example of the need for that bill. Because then when those claims come in of, hey, we're not getting promoted, hey, we're being harassed in the break room, you know, ex we're not being paid as much, we're being put on more dangerous jobs, or we're being first to, forced to work more hours, you can't fully assess that discrepancy beyond those stories that are easily dismissed if they're not legally mandated to report who's working by race. That's very, first of all, a very inspiring story about how you, you know, were able to open the Attorney General's mind and inspire a policy that changed the way that they report data in the state. He's a pretty chill dude. It was, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, but that brings up a, an interesting point that policy, it does take a while to implement. And yeah, I, I think it might have been about a year and a half, two years between, which is why I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if that's what started yeah. it. You know what I mean? Like, because no one called me afterwards. I'm like, okay, what did you say now? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it was a couple years. Wow. So, would you say then that data, like, pub being able to publish data itself can make a difference, at least in the short term, while policy is, you know, being worked on behind the scenes? That way you can shed light on an issue? Or is it really the policy change that needs to happen? <laughs> I think both, like, because the data, there's different audiences for data, and so of course there's different ways you present it. We definitely, you know, Black Voice News has a huge audience in Sacramento because we do like a lot of government accountability reporting. So we know that when we're publishing things, elected officials are going to be likely to see what we're publishing, and so they're in mind. But we're also a community newspaper based in the Inland Empire, right? And so we're also publishing things for our community members. I, I've often, I often say, like, in this work, I when we look at data, I'm learning things about my own life that I didn't realize, like, that's why these things are happening to me. I sprained my foot really badly early in July, um, and so I went to an urgent care. And you know, and I, I have insurance, so they gave me a brace, it was free, my copay is like $5, and you know, and that's what I did. I, I don't have a primary care provider in, in the Inland Empire. Um, you know, part of it can blame on how confusing insurance is, but also when you look at the data, we do not have enough primary care providers for the number of people who live in the region. What we do have is a plethora of urgent care centers. So why would I naturally go to an urgent care center versus calling a doctor? Because that's what I see, right? So that's what I have access to, that's what I go to. Um, and so, you know, in writing about that or reporting about those sorts of things, I'm telling the community, hey, this is why you're in the situation where you don't have a like a like a health practitioner that you see regularly. And I'm also telling the state, or we're also telling the state, hey, like this is an issue. Like, how can you like pass policy to make it easier for for public providers to like invest here or move here or whatever the case may be? Um, and so it it all when we talk about one solution, it's not just one thing. It's not just the policy being passed. It's the people knowing what the problem is so that they can advocate for themselves and so that they can address it so that they can t talk to their elected officials, they can talk to their community members. Um, it's the policy doing their job to make sure laws are passed that people have to do things. And then also on the other end of it, you know, there's philanthropy. And a big, a big portion of our work now has been advocating for communities with philanthropists and saying like, hey, the Inland Empire is heavily underinvested compared to Los Angeles and the Bay Area. And the reason why I'm comparing it to Los Angeles and the Bay Area is because we are the third largest region in the state and um, we have the third largest black population and by the next census, we will have the second largest black population. We are going to eclipse Los Angeles. However, we are grossly underfunded per capita by, I don't want to, I don't want to make up numbers off the top of my head, so I'm going to stop there, but we're grossly underfunded per capita in comparison to Los Angeles and San Francisco. So if nobody points out, hey, look, all these people are moving east and these, these, and they're encountering all these new issues because the region is not equipped to provide the supports that they need due to gross underfunding, we're also lobbying to philanthropists as well. So there's, there's residents, there's community-based organizations that need access to this information, there's philanthropists, and you also have you have your your lobbyists and also your business owners because they can like you know they create jobs a black person is more likely to have to work at a black owned company than any other company um and and so all of those things like all of those industries benefit from data 
that's very valuable to know the different stakeholders and how they like interact with or benefit from data. And I think, to your point, the Inland Empire, I think we're kind of insulated from realizing it here in California because we have such a large population, but if this is something that the dean of our school mentions a lot. It is the size of a decently sized state. We're a super region. Yeah. It's huge. Like we could, you know, cut a little hole in the middle of California for us and become our own state mm -hmm. in theory um, with our population. So it's interesting that, you know, despite that, and despite the fact that a lot of the residents in the Inland Empire commute to nearby counties like Los Angeles County to work. Um, and it causes a lot of other issues. Um, but yeah, no, not despite the fact, in combination with the fact, right? That's a whole other issue. Yeah, and I mean, that brings into a lot of other things on how then, you know, residents in the Inland Empire get affected disproportionately by the pollution to go drive over to the other counties. But instead of rambling on about yeah, that, we can go down a whole, I can put on a whole thing about that. Yeah, we'll drive, we'll, um, <laughs> instead of rambling. Um, Kind of shifting again, we mentioned, um, we've been talking a lot about data, mm -hmm. but now we're seeing a lot about big data in the news and mm -hmm. the growing of AI and all these different AI such as ChatGPT. Um, what would you say is the current state of comprehensive and inclusive data availability with this new rise of big data? And what barriers, if any, are limiting access to it specifically? Um, the current state, I don't know if I can speak on a macro level to the current state, because I, I, as someone who is exploring AI and at times uses it, I'm in count, I'm entering it from the opposite end of the spectrum of AI. You know, there's like the creative AI, and then there's me as a user who's like, there's use for this. And I'm trying, and I think with the current state, there is an opportunity to talk about bias and who do the people that create AI look like, what information are they gathering. Um, I've sat in on, on, on demonstrations of tools that like automatically like compile data and visualize it for you and like the things that they've gathered data on are things that are completely useless to black communities like it, like there was a tool I was looking at and it's being presented to a group of black newspapers and they were like can you show us like like economic outcomes for black people in the Houston area and they're like no but we can show you gas prices and it was like this is not your audience and so I think um, one there's an opportunity for um, diversified groups in data, um, in tech, to positively influence AI. Because, um, you know, they, they run bias tests all the time where like AI is heavily biased when it comes to like race and gender, right? Um, and so it's almost like very clear that like male white men coded AI. Um, and so one of the things is like, there's a danger then with big data not being diversified, not being disaggregated, all of those things that we experience in our in our daily work that then ai can perpetuate biases and misinform people um we know ai hallucinates and sometimes if it doesn't know it'll make things up and things of that nature so you have to be fact checking it but it also can outright misinform people about things because they, um, ai is also pulling from a repository so it's only pulling from the repository of what it knows or what it has access to it's called a rag and i'm blanking on what a rag stands for but it's a pile of information and so you ask, when you ask ChatGPT a question, it's going back to its rag to get an answer. So if it's not in there, it's gonna give you a partial answer or it's gonna give you a wrong one, right? And then you're taking that as gold. Um, so there are, so with big data, one, there needs to be um, engagement with and from other communities to ensure um, that it does not cause more harm because it can, and I've seen myself firsthand when, when people develop maps that are supposed to be good for everyone, and it's good, and it's harmful for very specific communities because of blind spots. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I think of with data is is the question you asked of who has access to it, and that's our whole work is who has access to this information that can use it um, for good or to change lives or, or you know the, whatever the case may be, positive case may be. Um, and data is very, very expensive. Not just to like buy or sell, but the reason why that is is because someone has to clean it, someone has to manage it, it can be very labor intensive, it requires an expertise. Anything that requires an expertise is gonna require a person who's gonna be expensive to like run it and be in charge of it. And so all of these things cre create additional barriers to accessing data. So then if your requests for data aren't coming from communities that look different, that's not the data you're gonna prioritize gathering. 
Um, and so that's that's another that's another big issue in thinking about this idea of big data. One of the things, and then monetizing data, right? So one of the things that's come up for us is like, you know, eventually like our own repository is going to grow to a size where we're going to need help managing it or to figure out how to manage it or have someone else manage it. And with that, is that person going to value our data repository as much as we do, right? If we decide to sell data, are they going to undervalue it? Because like historically, you know, products are like housing in areas of color is undervalued. And so black data will be undervalued. Um, and so things that I worry about is like, you know, if we ever decided to do something like that, which I'm not saying we will, but if we ever did, you know, are you only interested in this data now that you see that we have interest in the data um, or like that or that we get interest from clients in the data? You know what I mean? And even then, will you undervalue it when selling it to someone else versus this other data set that that is, is a mirror of ours? but it's not racially disaggregated or whatever the case may be. Those are all things that I think about. And so with that then, who has access to it, um, you know, community-based organizations, Black-led organizations, they, they then have a hard time accessing this information. And it's, it's easily dismissed as, oh, they don't view data as important or they don't understand it. Yes, they do. They just do not have the funds nor the capacity to be able to leverage it to really make the biggest impact. Um, and so things like big data, um, I'm not gonna villainize it because I don't I don't I don't know what it is or isn't in the sense of like AI is so new and, and tech and modernization and whatever else. But I think things like big data perpetuate these practices that started a long time ago. You know, like like someone if I thought long and hard enough, I can make a connection between red line and big data, and just in the mirrors of, of the practicing of how it works. Um, so so it's. I think it's very early on, and I think with that, there's an opportunity to maybe not get ahead, but get involved and get in stride. And that's something that I'm interested in exploring in, in the coming next couple of years, um, is as we're, we're positioned as data experts to, to, to think um, radically about the ways in which big data and AI um, and Web3 can be used to better the lives of our community members and not be, not, and not be detrimental. It, it, it's interesting that you bring up the cost of data being so expensive and kind of connecting that with earlier, you were talking about how with communities of color and black communities especially, you found that there's an intense need for qualitative data um, because a lot of things start um, just through word of mouth. Does that make, uh, do you find that's often more expensive then to collect data for communities of color because of those methods? So currently we've had a couple of, of explorations into collecting data as far as like doing it from scratch. Currently we largely pull from publicly available, available data sets. So you know, the state, Healthy Places Index, Policy Institute, things of that nature with the county, like that's where we pull most of our data from. We did prior to the COVID-19 map or dashboard, we tried to do a crowdsourced Black at Work map. Um, and what we learned from that is it is extremely difficult to get survey responses and the amount of work that goes into getting those survey responses for the return, um, it's not, it doesn't work for a small outfit, which I think is another obstacle in data collection and in making sure it accurately represents all populations is if there's data bias, and I'm not thinking about collecting on that population because of my own bias, then um, then it's not gonna get done because the smaller shops can't do it. So it's, what was your question again? I'm sorry. No, you're good. My question was, is it then more expensive to collect? Have you found it's more expensive to collect? Yeah, money? I don't know. I don't know if it's more expensive. I don't. I can't say that because we have, that's, yeah, let's narrow that. I, mm -hmm. I, I can't speak to that, honestly. Um, I do think that there is an interest. I, I can say from the from the side of like community based organizations, there is an interest in leveraging data, and because of financial barriers, they aren't always able to. And I, I think you know, but yeah, I can't speak to the cost of collecting it. We're not we're not there yet. That makes sense, and it it truly is a large process and undertaking to get the data to get responses. It, yeah, no, we learned that the hard way. And so we've done we've done a couple of, since then, more qualitative, or not qualitative, yeah, no, qualitative, qualitative, like data collections. And so I can't speak to that, actually. 
it's been far more focused though. So instead of like a crowdsourced thing of like email blast, tell us about your experience, upload a photo, you know, that kind of a thing, which we thought would be really cool. It was um, it was more strategic, and that's also something we learned is like you know a lot of times when you like even like like a GoFundMe right like the really successful ones have a mark basically a marketing strategy, um, and so we we've done we've we've gathered qualitative information on um, regarding media ecosystems, and so you know looking at like um, ethnic media ecosystems, and so our first our first round of doing that was in Los Angeles where we made we made a um a visualization looking at the landscape of ethnic media eco, ethnic media in Los Angeles. And so that required, you know, we did our web scrape but then for the information we didn't have we had to we had to call people. Um and so and then we we did something similar. Um there recently the the Inland Empire journalism hub and fund was launched and I think I left a word out of that. I'm gonna get in trouble for that. It's such a long name. Yeah, I was about to say. Let me see. Let me see what it's called. The, 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 in the Empire, I think it's during, there's an extra word in there. Let me see. Hub. Hub and fund. What is it called? Oh, the Inland Empire. No, it is. The Inland Empire. Oh, it was right. Because it had several different names in the oh, growing okay. up. So the Inland Empire Journalism Hub and Fund is also like a coalition that's building in the region with um, local media outlets um, and primarily local media, out- like ethnic media outlets. And that was also a similar data collection effort of just like seeing, okay, who are all the print papers? What are all the TV stations? What are all the, the radio stations? Radio is the biggest like media industry in the region. There are so many radio stations. Um, and so we've had some success there. Um, and that's just, a, but it's, it's really, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's expensive. I guess it's expensive because it's time consuming. It's very like unsexy work of like being really good at Google and then having to call people for additional information. Um, even with our, we have the most compre- we have the only comprehensive statewide map of black led organizations. There's over 600 black led organizations on the map. And we were able to find people, some people had lists of different collectives or, you know, um, you know, the Bay Area had a really like comprehensive list of everything. The Bay Area is always really organized. They're always, for whatever reason, way more organized than Southern California is. Um, and so like, but part of it as well was just just old school Googling and like combing through websites and like, and, and just doing different keywords. So I think that's also like a barrier to doing some of that data collection is it's, it's really time consuming and it, like it's, like that was my uh, my project manager and primary data analyst at Street. That was her like her main job for like three or four months. You know, it was basically to be a Google expert, even though she has expertise in so many other things. Um, so that and that's and I think that's a barrier to big data too, is because the management of it and the collection of it is so time consuming that then it's expensive and then there's then that creates the pricing issue, right? Of then who has access to it? Because you're gonna charge a premium for all this work you put in to gathering this thing. And then not even just to gather, but then to keep it up to date. And that might also still be just like how a person had to call each and every outlet to see, okay, like what's your distribution? What's your reach? They gotta do it again in six months or in whatever. So yeah, that's it, it does really, it's a testament to how much work gets put into it and the, main, the maintenance of data, not just that initial collection. Mm-hmm. Um, as a final question to wrap up today, we talked about it indirectly a lot, and actually directly a lot, <laughs> but can you touch on data advocacy? Like really what is data advocacy and um, the role that equity plays in data reporting and collecting? I think it goes, uh, data, I learned, I my, I realized we were data advocates in the moment when I was talking to the attorney general. Cause I was, it's a matter of just asking for what you need. And sometimes in asking for what you need, you create a mess. There are times where I've been looking for something and I've like blown something else up and I'm like, I didn't need to do that, but I got what I needed. You know what I mean? And so I wrote like even my job, my job as a project director is to get what my team needs. My team says they need X, I'm gonna go out and find X. Um, and it made me not start some trouble in the process accidentally, but I, that's just because I'm getting X for whatever the team needs or what, like the project or what, and really what they need is what the community needs, right? Um, and so with data advocacy, it's one, you know, talking to people who have, who have access to things that can help you out, but also like sometimes people don't realize that that need was there. And it's not because they, like sometimes they intentionally cover it up, right? When you're re- researching police records and they don't report on the race of the, of the people who were hospitalized, that's intentional. Yeah. You know, that, that's odd. But there's other times, like in the case of the attorney general, he, like 
he, he, he one probably didn't know, and two, like like whoever you know, um, stopped reporting on it, segregated by, by race, didn't realize the impacts of it. You know, and it's, it's it can be as simple as that sometimes. So I think with data advocacy, um, that's a, like a big like a big sounding term of like going to the capital, but really it's just I asking for what you need. And, and, and communicating that and if you don't if other if, if people in a position to make lives better don't realize that that need exists then they can't do anything about it um and and, so, and part of that too is why it's so important to like equip community members and residents of data as well so they can ask for what they need because then if all these people are asking for what they need oh this is a need and not only not only do we know because all these people are asking for it, but there's also these numbers here that are supporting it and then those people can even use the numbers i'm not just the only one who has an issue with the cost of my housing or who has an issue with the quality of the water coming out the faucet because this data shows x you know what i mean um so i really i think all of it i think in any in any work any mission-driven work, you're you're working on behalf of of a community's needs, and in that process, right? There's a vulnerability in in, in anyone saying, "I need this. I'm I'm dealing with this. I don't have." I don't have access to this. I don't know whether I need this, right? Because you're saying I need help. And even for me, sometimes, like like when I blow up things, I'm like, I didn't mean to blow that up. It's because I was I didn't know who to go ask for what. And I, you know what I mean? And I'm saying, hey, we don't know this, right? Because even as like data experts, there's a, there are things we encounter all the time where I have to call someone and say, hey, like you've worked your 20 years versus my five. Like, what can you tell me about X, Y, and Z? And they'll say, oh, we'll talk to that person. And sometimes I'm emailing random people, or but it's me saying I need this. And I think any advocacy advocacy work is saying, I need this, we need this, they need this. Um, and and on and like the vulnerability of, of asking for what you need. That's honestly a great place to end the podcast. Tying this back to what you said in the very beginning on how data is more than just numbers. It's not just about being intentional, but also about, as you've been explaining, being informed about the population from which you're gathering data because there may be underlying problems or underlying um, causes for problems that either aren't being reported on or noticed or even people aren't um, in a space where they feel comfortable sharing about it. I also want to say to that, because I know at one point we tried to skew a positive and I was like, oh. Um, it's, it's also, the data doesn't have to be bad. So it's underlying problem, but it's also values. So is the so like even if I'm addressing the issue right that you told me was an issue is my solution to addressing the issue in alignment with your values of what you would consider a like an optimal solution that's another big part of it um, is 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 data also tells you about a community's values and, and what and and that's also part of the actual need of I live in this place and my values aren't being met in some sort of way. Um, or this solution doesn't, you know, doesn't meet what I actually care about. That's what your values are, is what you care about. Versus a lot of times it's other people telling you what, what you should care about. Yeah, like a public problem has to start with, you know, is it something that the public finds important? Yeah, um, and the solution to it too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then that goes more into metrics. But with that, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an honor to get to speak with you on data and data advocacy and all the different stakeholders and interactions that come into play in creating a hopefully more informed data and policy environment. Well, thank you. This podcast is a production of the UC Riverside School of Public Policy, and our theme music was produced by Veer Sinha. For the latest updates on the School of Public Policy, be sure to check us out at UCR underscore SPP on Instagram, or for more episodes and content, visit our YouTube channel. I'm Rachel Strassman. Till next time.